What is your privacy worth and what would you do to protect it? Let's talk about it today with Blues Ain't No Mockingbird by Tony K. Bumbara. I think that we all set up our little islands in our houses and we don't want anybody to know what's going on in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina, two friends talking about literature and what it means to us. My name is Una. And I am not having the blues crypto. So this is an interesting story on the surface, right? Because first of all, I don't know about you, I was kind of surprised that we headed to the deep rural south. Like, that's not a usual scenario we've seen Bumbara write about so far. This is, I think, her first story that we have read that is doesn't take place in New York City with a transplant from the south to the big city, right? Well, they definitely take place in that setting, right? Yeah. So for, for me, that was my first kind of shock. I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. We're getting a different setting. Like, I haven't seen her write this. But it's interesting because we have, uh, I didn't know how to take these characters at first, right? Because we had the narrator, we had her sister, you know, Kathy, we had the twin boys, we had the uh, granny, and then Grandpa Kane, and then just these two men that were cameraman and smiley, like they didn't even get names, interestingly (laughs) enough, but a fairly decent, you know, array of uh, characters here. So we start out, and they're just kind of, the boys are playing on the swing, granny's making rum cakes, and the two men just kind of show up taking pictures. Oh, good evening, ma'am. You wouldn't mind if we take pictures of your place. And as a matter of fact, Granny does mind, right? She does indeed. (laughs) (laughs) We're taking pictures of the food stamp program. You wouldn't mind if we took pictures of you poor people, would you? So um, they kind of back off a little bit around the edge of the property, and Granny tells a story about a man who tried to commit suicide by jumping off a bridge. A camera crew was taking pictures of them, and they saved a few just in case, right? Which I think dates this a little bit, because to me, the time frame of this wasn't clear. But the fact that the cameramen are using film puts it at least least 80s or before, right? Well, if this was 1971, yeah, it has to be somewhere there, 60s, 70s. Mm. She's writing into the future, into the 80s, yeah. Uh, so definitely it's not digital, not taking pictures on phones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, because this was published in 1971. Food stamp program came out of the Great Depression. This is, this is leading up after that, obviously. So anyways, she never finishes the bridge story, right? And then we kind of transition into Kathy and the story of Goldilocks, right? And again, they're kind of telling it from the perspective, a different perspective, I would say. Bombaro's always good about giving that perspective, and uh, the two little boys are like, man, what'd you do to protect your area? And they, they kind of go off and fight. And that's when good old Granddaddy Kane returns from the fields <laughs> with a dead chicken hog just <laughs> slung over his shoulder, just blood, just he's red, covered in it. Uh, because uh, I guess this hawk was swooping down and killing their chickens. I think this is what we're kind of meant to believe. So he's protecting his his chicken coop or whatever, if you will. It's, it's a money source for them. Right? He's protecting the family's security. So the mate hawk kind of appears and starts swooping down at them. Everyone panics. And that's when granddaddy kind of over the, I couldn't tell if he threw a hammer, but they said over his arm and the hammer is a piece of a gun, a part of a gun. So I'm pretty sure he shot the hawk, just <laughs> snipes this hawk back down, <laughs> nails the hawk up against the uh, uh, barn there as a kind of a warning. And then uh, one of the men are kind of standing in the flower bed, you know, and, and granddaddy's like, you got to get out of that flower bed. Hand, you know, holds out his hand for the camera, gives him the camera, rips out the film, right? Which if obviously we don't know what that means by today because we don't really use film cameras anymore. If you expose that film, it would destroy the picture. So by dismantling it, by ripping out the film, he's kind of destroying this man's work for the day. Like all of his pictures that he's taken on that film just, just destroyed, right? So the men kind of slowly back away from there. <laughs> And uh, Kathy says that one day she'll have to write a story about the events and about the proper usage of a hammer. Kind of end plot right there. So how do we think about this family? Right? I, I guess I mentioned during the plot summary that they were poor, but is that a given? Do, do, did you take them that they were on the lower end of economic scale? Yeah, I think that our only clue for that really is the idea of that they are possibly on the food stamp program. We don't know that for sure. It's just the camera crew assumes that this family is and that they're going to ask them, hey, can we take pictures because you're on the food stamps program? We want to show how well it's working and how much it's helping people that might be struggling. 
So I think that's kind of the only clue that this family is, you know, maybe of, you know, lower economic status. Now, when an author portrays lower economic status and, and opportunities, there's a lot of different ways they can go about that. How would you say, how, let's start with Granny. How would you say Granny is kind of positioned from that perspective? Do I mean, you, she's the matriarch of the family here, right? And but she also has a sense of protecting her family and upholding the pride of the family, like, so what that we aren't as, you know, high ranked as you, Mr. Fancy Cameraman. It doesn't mean that we're lesser than you. Why should you have the right to take these pictures? And that's what kind of the cameramen are almost implying. Like, we have a right to take pictures of you because you're on the food stamp program. And mm -hmm. Granny's like, nah, uh, uh, not, not here, sir. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. The idea of, well, the government's giving you this, like you, you don't have a right to your privacy. You should have to show off how it's helping. Interesting. I hadn't thought about that angle. I would definitely say I agree with you on the prideful angle, right? Like she's proud of what she owns. And there's even that line of granddaddy Kane when he walks about talking about this is our own, right? Like they're, they're, they're very proud of what they've had. And it couldn't help but make me think about how they talk about how they've moved a couple different times. And even when you, some people will go from rags to riches, from, you know, being, you know, rich to being poor, but on the inside, who are they as a person? And I noticed there's like that little line, kind of like in the opening paragraph where they're talking about the ladle and how the ladle has, you know, you know, pulled out rum for the rum cakes. It's gotten this at Christmas time. They talk about all the different jobs the ladles performed. And they also kind of, to right. me, kind of compare in this story how this family's moved a couple different times. And it made me kind of question, okay, maybe we've been in a lot of different situations in our life. And maybe right now we're in a, a situation of poor economic status and needing assistance for food stamps per se. But I think you can still be proud of who you are. You can still be the ladle and be in a lot of different jobs and situations in the same way that a family can have a lot of different jobs and situations in their life, but be proud of who they are. I agree with that. And I think it also is too setting up the idea that just because someone has more money than you doesn't entitle them to think that they're better than you. And I think that's how granny and granddad Kane feel about these cameramen over them, that they feel like they're better. And then, you know, once they're kind of called out, the cameraman, you know, back off a little bit, like, no, 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 you know, we're so sorry for your situation. We're really are trying to help you. And like, no, you're not. You're trying to make money off their misfortunes. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. So when it comes to making money, we got to talk about privacy, right? I think that's a very common thing to kind of jump into this. But I want to talk about what does privacy create? When, when we need privacy and we're not getting it, what do we do? Because you have the bridge story where this guy's at the low point of his life. I think exactly what you're just talking about. We're going to make money off of you potentially choosing something to end your life, right? And they're saving a few, as in saving a couple of the last shots because film only had a limited number of shots you could take. And... They're going to make money off of this misfortune. And the same thing with Goldilocks. She invades someone else's home. Like that's a story we tell our children to teach them about the dangers of going into strangers' homes, right? But from the other perspective, from the bear's perspective, their privacy is being violated, right? What right do they have to protect that privacy or this jumper even? And you'll notice that as soon as we start bringing up, what would you do to protect that privacy? What do the two little boys start doing? They, you know, fought back. They, have, they, they start fighting each other, right? And they, and they have that quote, did they make her pay for it? Asked Terry, making a fist. I'd have made her pay me. So you can see that the little boys are even looking at physical aggression as a form of protection of privacy even. And I don't know if you picked up on this, but there's a couple of different times this kind of came up, right? So when the granddaddy enters, you know, he's very terse. Short with words, like you're in the Mrs. Yeah. Garden, right? <laughs> you stand in, in the yeah, Mrs. He, Flower. He, he's bed. definitely the, the the protector of the family. And what immediately happens, right? He's got this dead hawk that that he killed because it was eating his food source. They're chickens, right? The chickens that they're either selling the eggs, eating the eggs, something to benefit the family. It's probably a production of some sort. And this hawk comes along and kills him. What's he do? He protects it. Protects yeah. it. Right? And the same thing that we do with privacy in a sense. And then when he did that to the chicken hawk and he hammers it up on the farm, what, you know, and hawks mate for life, interestingly enough, what's that chicken hawk's mate do? So it's sent a message from granddad. No, no, no. What's the mate, the one that's alive to? Oh, 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 oh I don't remember. It comes back and starts swooping at them. And then I think even one of the little girl's comments like, oh, it's almost like it's trying to protect its mate. 
right? When okay, the hawk's yeah, privacy yeah. is, is, you know, his, his mate is taken away from him. And what does the, I say him, I don't know if it's male, female, but what does <laughs> the mate do? It goes to protect what it thinks is theirs, right? Whether we view that as privacy, whether we view it as protecting your food source or your, your, you know, your lover in a sense, there's, there's all these themes of protection that keep popping up. And, you know, once again, okay, here we go one more time. What's the granddaddy do when his family is threatened by the chicken hawk? Okay, so he shoots it. See, I guess I took it as the cameramen were the hawks. <laughs> and I, I, I saw them as like swooping in to try to steal from the family. I okay. like that point. Okay, so, so you took it as kind of like direct symbolism of the people yeah. in the story. Okay. The cameramen are, you know that that you know kind of a scavenger you know mm, i mean i don't know okay. if hawks are actually scavengers i think they actually do hunt but i guess these guys are hunting for a story and they are you know out there you know trying uh, but i don't know they are they feel they feel predatory right the, these mm. cameramen out there that is that's how i felt bombara portrayed them okay and, and there's nothing wrong with taking things different ways right i, I think bombara was such a great writer and I think, you know, like some of the great things that she accomplished in terms of creating like the first like, you know, black author, vo female author voices anthology. Uh, she, she was very involved in the activist space. So to me, I'm always kind of like, what's what's her call to action? Because I always feel like these great authors, they're compelled to tell a story, not just for entertainment, sometimes in my opinion, but sometimes these great authors are, ha are having this call to action. And I couldn't help but just, my mind at least, focused on this idea of what what do you go, what do you do? What do you, what's your next step when your privacy or, or things in your belongings, like the three little bears, like what's the next step you do to protect that? Like to what lengths would you go? And you see how these families, these, these chicken hawks, like everyone in this story will risk it all, right? And that makes, I think that makes people question of what, what makes it worth it to potentially invade upon others space, other people's lands. Right. I like that. I guess I, I think that probably, you know, the best interpretation of the story we've read quite a few of, uh, Bambara's stories on the channel. And I feel like I was looking at it for more of a bird's eye view. Uh, see what they did there. <laughs> and I was thinking about this story in terms of her other stories that we've read and, and the uniqueness of this one, like I talked about at the beginning. And I felt like that this one was something that was um, irregular to her normal stories of set in New York and more of a Northern style. This one very much had that Southern feel to it. The uh, grammatical Southern vernacular feel to it, which was very unusual for her writing. I felt like this one was more giving a narrative to something that she was growing as a writer and an author uh, that maybe wasn't something that she was very familiar with to say that we're more than just a specific region of this country. Our roots are deep in this country uh, and we, we, we are at, in every aspect of the United States. And, you know, because she is trying to be, you know, one of those progressive uh, authors, I think, during a very tumultuous time during our country, you know, of, uh, you know, race issues in, in the 1960s and 70s. Well, I think it's undeniable she did great things for this country and great things for literature. I have one more question. What did you think of the title of this story? I think there was a, kind of a hidden message there as well, because we had the, 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 the Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and then you have mm. Blues Ain't No Mockingbird. And I, I I think it was not referring to the color blue. I think it was referring to like when somebody's down in blue, you mm. shouldn't mock them. Like you shouldn't take advantage oh. of somebody that is down on their luck. And that's what the cameramen are doing. And they're saying, hey, don't take advantage of people when they're down. Like you should lift them up. And these guys, they're they're like vultures. So I guess maybe that would have been too, no, too on the head if she'd used vultures instead of hawks. <laughs> Well, and it's also worth pointing out that as soon as they were gone, do you remember what she started doing? Who, who she, the narrator, the granny, she went back to the, the garden. She started whistling. So she started singing. Oh when, yeah. She got happy. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So I, I could, I could support that view for sure. 
Yeah, another you know amazing unique story by Tony Kate Bambara, and we'll leave a playlist down below where you can watch our other videos on her. We post videos two days a week, Mondays and Thursdays, and sometimes a bonus video on Tuesdays. Peace. Luna out.